um, thank you all for coming along. So, the need to drive learning and progress in schools has never been so great. COVID has accelerated long-term challenges across the education system. So today we are left with one in three students below a grade four, also in grade four, below basic reading level. The average student lost four to five months of learning during the first year of COVID. And in fact, if you are black or Hispanic, on average, you lost 70% more learning days during COVID. Now, I don't think it's controversial to say that we believe assessment is a vital tool to tackle this challenge to help us size the gap, track the gap, and continue to close the gap. But assessment itself isn't without controversy. How can we make testing fair, equitable, and accessible? How should testing be integrated into the classroom, and what does AI, and more broadly, ChatGPT, mean for the future of assessment? And how can we ensure assessment is focused on the skills that really matter to create the workforce and leaders of the future? Today, we will tackle this topic of assessment. My name is Wayne Redmond. I'm a partner at McKinsey, and I'm joined by five colleagues who spend much of their work and life focused on this topic. Today, I have uh, Steve Krumer, the president of Cambium Assessment, Dylan William, formerly professor of educational assessment at UCL, and Paul Gullish, the GM of ETS Global K-12 Business, Elizabeth Lennertz, VP of Marketing at Imagine Learning, and Michael Sharman, the SVP of Product at Lenocity. So, I'm gonna start by trying to frame where we are today. A two-part question I'm gonna to direct towards, first of all, Steve and Elizabeth. How important is assessment and testing in US education? And is the current US education sy assessment system fit for purpose? Yeah, thank you. Um, so the business that, that I run, we think about mostly the high stakes summative assessments. So I'll have kind of a, a basis for that. We also deliver interim tests, formative assessments. And I think it's very um, important. Uh, think about assessment, tracking students, having a better idea where uh, not just individual students, but where the, the, the progress that's being made um, at the district level, at the state level. And you, know, you mentioned about learning loss, and we ran a, a, a study, very interesting, that started uh, pre-COVID and then three years later, so 2019, 2020, 2021, and we looked at a common cohort of students in grades three, four, and five, and we measured where they were uh, prior to the pandemic and then immediately thereafter. And now we're looking at exactly the same set of students, and we recognized and saw that, for example, in ELA, and writing that students were anywhere from uh, five to eight percent below where they were in terms of grade level, those kids that were actually making grade level. Then we looked at math, and it was really astounding. Um, those numbers went from anywhere from 15 to 21 percent uh, where students were no longer making grade level. And as a matter of fact, the cohort from fifth grade to seventh grade, only one quarter of those students actually met grade level in math. So I think about assessment and testing, and I think about where, you know, if we didn't have some type of standardized test, we'd kind of be all over the map in terms of results like that, which also drive funding and drive individual instruction. Yes, thank you. I think it's really interesting. I mean, those are sobering statistics that you opened up with and that you underscored there. And I think there's equally sobering statistics around the profession of teaching, too, and what we're seeing, obviously, with teacher capacity and teacher shortage. And I think the only way through being able to really solve that is to think about not assessment and testing, but the data that comes out of that assessment and testing and how we make it actionable and informative. Um, I, had a, I had a chance to jump the queue for the session a couple uh, sessions ago on data, and there were a lot of really interesting conversations about teacher workflow and how we improve teacher workflow with data and one-to-one. -one. I think the power with this assessment and testing is thinking about district workflows and how do they actually use that assessment to drive those results. When you think about that, again, where we're coming out of the uh, post-pandemic, I think there's an opportunity to really work with districts to think about how do they want to measure success. And it's not just performance on high stakes assessments, and it's not just graduation rates. It's thinking about what are they doing to really wrestle with preparing students for the world? What are they really doing to in, in 
uh, foster student agency to support teachers. And I think if we have an assessment and we think differently about that assessment system, that's what can really drive that difference in a much deeper way. So maybe building on that and, and going on over to, to Michael, um, building on a previous conversation we had, what other pain points would you talk about maybe in this around accessibility, inclusivity, and you know, the pain points we see today in the current assessment system? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we saw throughout the pandemic a huge acceleration of companies' digital plans, um, whether they had it on their roadmap or not. All of a sudden, everyone needed to go digital. But unfortunately, a lot of the tools, the technologies, uh, weren't really there you know, from an inclusive perspective. And, you know, that's really one of the goals for, uh, for everybody. Um, what we try and do is really target, uh, a, you know, inclusivity. So we're not only looking at people with, uh, you know, disabilities, we're looking at everybody. You can have a stronger learning experience, a stronger assessment experience. The more you're thinking about universal design, the more you're thinking about inclusivity from the get-go. It really, it, it's so important. Um, these days, content comes through in all shapes and sizes. It's not just text, it's images, it's video, it's audio. And you've got, you know, people who maybe uh, either English is a second language, or they have some sort of motor impairment, cognitive impairment, visual impairment, all of the above, or, you know, they don't have any disability, but by creating tools that are more inclusive, their experience uh, in learning and assessing is, is so much stronger. So I think it's one of the most important things we should be focusing on in terms of, you know, the experience of the tools. Thank you, and maybe just to, to wrap up on our reflections of the current system, Dylan or, or Paul, Anything you want to add on, on when you look at where we are today, you know, what are the real big pain points? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would just say that it, it's, I think it's definitely not purpose built uh, for today's society. I mean, it, it really hasn't been a lot of innovation deployed in how we assess or even how we teach. I mean, if you guys read Bill Gates's letter on generative AI, I mean, ed tech in general has been sort of a letdown in terms of its ability to drive outcomes. I think that's the same for assessments. Um, we're capable now of collecting much sort of richer data signals and more of them in an experiential fashion, and we, and we really don't. We, it's, it's still fairly limited. So I think there's a lot of work to do, um, but it's exciting work um, and, and very worthwhile. I think the only thing I would add is that Rather than talking about this thing of learning loss, I think it's useful to distinguish between missed and misplaced learning. So missed learning is the chance the kids didn't get to, to learn. The other thing we have to be very careful of is if we test kids right after they return back from school, you'll get very low scores just because they haven't had a chance to rehearse that. And so I'm very suspicious of a lot of the scare stories we're getting because a bit of, 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 of renewal, a bit of refresh, would actually give those students, get that back up to where they were. That said, the thing that I haven't got my head around, uh, the learning loss in the US seems to have been much greater than in the rich countries of Europe. So typically, we were seeing two to three months for kids in socially disadvantaged areas, one month for more affluent kids in England. And the, the learning loss in the United States has been much greater. And I haven't heard any convincing explanations. So. We can have, a, have that argument later. The important point is, what's next? I mean, the kids are where they are, so let's not worry about fighting fault. Let's work on what can we do to move everybody forward. Yeah, really interesting point, and we'll come back to the international perspective a bit later um, on that. And so if people have reflections, let's save those up and let's talk about the difference we see in the US versus elsewhere. But building on topic of kind of tech and on data, maybe now I would like to think about delving deeper on that and what role should EdTech play in assessment? And kind of what is the importance of online tools and the power of new tech to really drive good, you know, impact-driven assessment? And maybe, Elizabeth, would you like to, to start with a, a reaction to that? Sure, I mean, I think the ability to harness that technology is, is really the only way, again, that we can help solve some of these issues that we've articulated. When we think about um, the, the support that that technology can do to drive 
the synchronous instruction, how a teacher can arrive to that synchronous instruction, being informed about what the students in their classroom already know, what they can build on, and make that synchronous instruction that much more effective, it's, it's, it's powerful. When we think about the role then that can happen with asynchronous, in asynchronous instruction in all forms, whether it's tied to that core instruction, whether it's part of supplemental and intervention, whether for us in a credit recovery system. So that assessment and driving that, that using that technology to really power that asynchronous instruction and having that tie together to really help inform that what's next is really critical. Yep. And I don't know if anyone wants to jump on now. Perfect. I think the really exciting thing is that I think that these generative technologies are going to allow us to have much more authentic assessment. The United States is unique in spending something like $150,000 on educating each child and completely screwing it up by measuring it entirely with multiple choice tests. No other country does that. And so the argument for multiple choice tests is that they're inexpensive. Pretty soon, we're going to have assessment of authentic tasks and, and performance assessments that are as inexpensive as multiple choice tests. So we should be able to move towards assessments that encourage a positive backwash into instruction. Right now, what we see is a lot of instruction being driven by the specter of accountability testing. Drilling kids for multiple choice tests isn't the best way to increase the score on multiple choice tests, but a lot of people believe that, which is why so much of the practice in classrooms is impoverished. When we have more more authentic assessments as being the high stakes assessments, I think we'll see better pedagogy develop. And we're already seeing the, the cost come down with, with AI scoring of constructed response items. It's, it's, uh, I think that, that time is here. You know, thank goodness, it's, it's overdue, right? Yep. Maybe she, oh. Yeah, I'd like to add something. Uh, and that is that many of the tests in the past were multiple choice tests, right? But now, using technology, most all of the tests, every state test has mostly um, online tests and online, um, and I'm gonna say uh, rich item types that can be now machine scored, they can be AI scored, so the, uh, even essays can be AI scored. So I think, you know, in, in getting the results back to uh, teachers in a timely enough fashion that they can think about changing instruction at the classroom level, um, interfacing with other um, supplementals, so that yes, I, I think it has changed uh, to a very positive way as we moved away from multiple choice. Actually, perfect, and I want to bridge that on to, Michael, the conversation we had about multiple choice. I think you, you talked very eloquently about how we need to raise the standards of, of online assessment. Um, and very similar to them, move away from just multiple choice, but do you want to add to what's been said so far? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if the majority of testing was being done on multiple choice in 2023, I'd be a little disappointed, um, purely because of the options that we do have out there. Um, and I think a lot of it is context as well. If you're in the formative journey, you know, a multiple choice may be testing recall, but how are you going to um, drive true understanding, a deep understanding uh, of curriculum, uh, and therefore that can inform coming back to data, getting data back to the teachers in the classroom as quickly as possible so they can make decisions on change for their program, you know, the next week, the next two weeks, based on, you know, these ongoing formative journeys. And multiple choice has its place, absolutely, but, you know, there are so many other types um, you know, from drag and drops to using rich media, audio and video, you know, where there's so many capabilities now and raising the bar is something we like to be a part of, not only for ourselves, but for our customers as well and other companies out there. Um, again, multiple choice, if that's all we're thinking, you know, there's a lot more out there and uh, it's really how you use it, where you use it, how you share those insights. That's the whole point of using these. Um, not just they look shiny, you're supposed to, you know, in, to gather a greater understanding of the student ability by using these. So, you know, the future is really, really bright. On, on the AI piece, look, I'm not sure where AI scoring is going to come in in the summative sense, but certainly in the formative journey, um, I can see scoring uh, to assist graders is really, really powerful. Also, I think we can use these newer tools, newer, they've been around for a long time, but now they're now sort of commoditized. Um, you can use it for students to learn how to write better essays, how to construct better responses with real-time feedback. So I think those sorts of applications that are going to come out in the next year or two are going to be really, really interesting. I do want to sound a cautionary note here. So using a spell checker will help you write better text. It won't necessarily teach you how to spell. 
And so what I'm worried about is that we're actually giving students technology that improves the work that they hand in, but doesn't require them to think for themselves. They become more and more dependent on the technology. So for me, you know, good feedback is not about improving the, the work that the student hand in, hands in. Good feedback improves the learner so they can do a better job on their own the next time. And I think one of the problems we have with our ed tech is it's evaluated over such a short time scale, it's improving the work but not the learner. And this is really important in education because good teachers often don't appear to be good teachers until their students have left them for two or three years. Good teachers benefit the teachers who have their students in the future because they build such sound foundations for future learning. And what worries me is tech re re relies on very short feedback loops for machine learning, and I think education is not very well suited to that kind of thing, because short-term successes often lead to long-term failures. So, so just to push you on that, because I think it's a really interesting point, is look, what should we change to in increase the life cycle which we assess and to integrate AI and other tech in a way that benefits the learner, not just the outputs they hand in? Well, I think we have to just be very clear about what the goal is here. Is it to hand, improve the work that the students hand in, or do we look for longer-term benefits? And I think that's one point. The other point is to realize the fundamental limitations of the assessment technology. So this is not a tech problem. This is an assessment problem. Let me give you an example. Let's say we give students a 60-item science test, 20 questions on biology, 20 on physics, 20 on chemistry. If you want to know how good that child is on biology, it would be tempting just to look at how well they did on the biology questions. Turns out that's not the best guide. The average score on the entire test, all 60 questions, is actually a better guide to how good they are at biology because the 20 questions on biology is a very short test and therefore the score is unreliable. And the fact that you're getting a longer test with 60 questions more than compensates for the fact that you're not asking all biology questions because the correlation of the scores between biology, chemistry, and physics is actually quite high. This is a kind of in the weeds point. But the, the, the difficulty is that diagnostic scoring, which everybody seems to be pushing these days, only works where the correlation between the different subscores is very low. And in most school subjects, it's not. So people are giving diagnostic scores to teachers who are acting on them, and they are not reliable enough to bear the weight that they are that they're asked to bear. And so there's some, there's some psychometrics here that we seriously have to take into account. It's really technical, and people don't want to talk about this stuff, but at the moment, a lot of the advice that teachers are being given is just simply inaccurate, because it doesn't take into account the unreliability of scores if you've only got five or 10 questions on a particular topic or unit, for example. And do you think rich item types or richer item types can help address that? No, or it makes it worse. A, it makes it worse. <laughs> So when you have rich item types, what's crucial is whether the kid liked the particular item type. Because when you have rich items, they're longer. And so therefore, you don't get to ask the kid so many questions. And a kid can get lucky five times. They can't get lucky 50 times. And so what we find is when we look at performance assessments in science, for example, how good the kid is at science, who scored the items, how hard the items were, are less important than how lucky the student was in the particular set of performance tasks they were asked to complete. So when you actually build in a lot of performance questions, you build in a massive amount of invisible unreliability, and it becomes a, a lottery. And so I think we have to accept that. Now, the, the good news out of this is we can maybe move with good technology towards assessing more stuff. And the evidence is once you get to about six or seven tasks, then you really are assessing that student's ability in science rather than just how lucky they were. So I think that's the way forward, is to have more kind of technology used to assess students as part of their work. The danger then, of course, is you get surveillance. Everything that students do is surveilled, and one, one, one mistake, one screw up, harms your chances. I want to know what the kid knows by the end of the semester, not what they did on every single item in that. And so there's, there's, the important point here is there's no correct solution. There's no great solution. There are only trade-offs. And I want us to talk about the trade-offs so they're made explicitly rather than bending up as unintended consequences of decisions taken further down the line. Do you want to ask? <laughs> <laughs> that, was a, that was like a 10 answer. I'm not going to be able to improve on that. But, but, is, but building on the point of, of how we move forward and, and how we can make it positive, maybe Elizabeth, I bring this back to the conversation we were having about 
some of maybe the macro trends you're seeing about how ed tech players are evolving in this space to use data um, and to help teachers. Um, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, we were talking about this, the question being how important is it to connect summative with formative with instructional assessments, and clearly extremely important. I mean, that's what we were talking about in the market, that we see, that's what we see happening in the market, that companies are looking at how they can aggregate that data, and, and both with uh, within their own portfolio sets and then across other companies as well. And I think for us, one of the it really fun and exciting things for us at Imagine Learning right now are the spaces that we're in. So we're in core instruction and supplemental and intervention, our credit recovery and our instructional services. And instead of thinking about connecting, just starting with it, thinking about summative, formative, instructional assessments, it's thinking about how are those, all of those spaces, what, how are those the use cases in a district? So what decisions are they making with their core instruction that are gonna inform the decisions they're making with their supplemental intervention or how they're setting up their, their credit recovery program? So I think spinning it for us instead of thinking about what, how should you connect formative, summative, and instructional is, how are you connecting all those programs and what you're trying to achieve and what data and assessment need to, to make those linkages is really exciting. Can I just build on that? I think that's absolutely right. I think too many people these days are focused on data-driven decision-making. What they need to be focused on is, is decision-driven data collection. We are starting from the data that we can actually give teachers. We're giving teachers these data, and we're saying, do something smart with this. And it doesn't fit into the teacher's work cycle. It doesn't, teach, it doesn't, it doesn't actually solve a problem that teachers have. So let's start with the kinds of information needs that the district has on a monthly, weekly, maybe daily basis, and then figure out what data, so it's a shift towards decision-driven data collection. I think that's gonna be crucial. And I think that the difference between teachers and at the district level too. I think that yeah. idea again of like instructional moments and teacher workflow, but high level, what districts the decisions they're making to be able to try to innovate and think differently about scheduling and, and, and how they're setting up their high schools or how they're approaching it. They need that assessment data in a different way to drive that. Where do you think we're further ahead? Like, are we closer at the teacher instructional level or at the, at the district level? Like, where, where's... I personally think we're much closer at the teacher level. I mean, I think those changes that you would see at a district level are just bigger and meatier and, 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 and heftier, whereas I think we talk a lot about those programs that are at a data, you know, at a, at a more of a teacher one-to-one. -one. We talk about how to empower the teacher with that data. I think the scale of the ones at the, at the district level are just bigger. On, on that note, actually, I'd love to bring in Steve. Um, obviously, a lot of experience at district level as well. Uh, what's your take on, on how we make this easier for districts, how edtechs need to support districts more with their data, with that assessment? Yeah, I, I, well, I do, as I mentioned earlier, thinking about online tests. Many of the states are moved to online, but they're also looking to uh, link interim assessments. To, they're tied to the state standards that are given in the summative test as well. So there really are three different test types that we're talking about. One would be a formative test that might be uh, developed by teachers in the schools uh, and delivered. Those tests can give raw score results. Uh, whereas an interim test it would be using test items that have been used previously, have item statistics, and now you can really get at how a student is doing progressing towards the end of the year. Uh, and progressing towards their summative tests. So I think that that link and that trend is really significant, and we're seeing it in more states. You know, I said we deliver uh, statewide testing contracts in over 25 states. Uh, those are the grades, you know, three to eight, primarily ELA, math, and science. And this trend is pretty significant. I think they're, you know, in many regards, uh, districts and schools buy lots of formative or other assessments, but they don't really um, meet the state standard. So then there's this sort of confusion that happens. So I, you know, I like the fact that, you know, we're seeing this sort of through course, through your assessment tide, and, you know, it's all technology that allows that to happen. It's all online, results are given back uh, immediately. And I was gonna make a point about one of the things we've been um, wrestling with too is obviously the ultimate goal is to have growth, is to measure that growth and th have those student outcomes, but that you can't go from zero beginning to growth. And so giving a little more intentionality and structure into how you, the metrics that can lead to growth. So we've been talking a lot about engagement and then progress and then achievement to growth and what your goals are setting those goals to drive to growth very specifically. It could be the first year of implementation of a product. You might expect much different metrics along the way or the specific product that you're using. So I think also giving a lot more structure 
to how you can measure and what are those assessments along the way to drive ultimately to growth. But I think we also have to be very careful about understanding which level we're measuring growth at. So I think the growth measures are going to be really important for at the district level. But the thing we have to remember is that, again, the limited technology of assessment. So typically, the kinds of tests that people use to measure student progress have an error of measurement equivalent to about six months' progress. So when you're saying to a kid, over the last six months, you've made six months' progress, give or take six months. <laughs> That's all you know. And so some kids look like they made great progress because they've been lucky. The first score they got was unluckily low, but the second score they got was very high. Other kids seem to have stalled because the first score, just through test on reliability, was higher than they deserved, and the second one was lower than they deserved. And so we have to understand that these st statistics often average out at the group level, and they can be very useful for monitoring at the, at the class level or the school level or even the district level, but at the level of the individual student, they are much less reliable. And I see a lot of people not understanding that and making completely unrealistic um, claims about students making progress or not making progress based on very unreliable change scores. Because don't forget, a change score is a number you get by subtracting one unreliable number from another unreliable number. And the difference is very unreliable. <laughs> so let me, let me add. Um, to get at that, however, um, many of the states are now using computer adaptive tests in grades K to 12. Not really thought in the past that you could do that except maybe in certification and licensure exams. And the reason I bring that up is that the reliability um, of the computer adaptive test is better than the reliability of a fixed form test. I mean, generally a psychometrician can tell you after three questions on a fixed form test how that student's going to do. Right? But as you are able to vary that test according to how that student is performing, that helps generate um, better reliable scores. Now, I certainly agree that at times, uh, depending on the number of items, that you might be able to say, all right, well, that's really important at the group level, at a classroom level, uh, more so than just an individual student. But it does help. Well, can I just say, the stats I just gave you were for an, uh, an adaptive test. So, so basically, yeah, an adaptive test will basically give you a 50% longer equivalent test. But the, the stats I just gave you about the error of measurement being equivalent to six months growth for students over the age of about 10 is from an adaptive test. It's from a national corporate company, and no company has cracked this problem because of the limitations of the technology. The only way to get more reliable results is to spend all the time testing kids, and we have better things to do with our time. What we need to do is to stop playing so much emphasis on the tests. You know, we could make the test more reliable, but I think we should just say, let's not take the test results so seriously, so let's start giving margins of error. Your child got 57 plus or minus 10. <laughs> that would be honest. That's what happens in other areas, and we don't do it in education. So, so an interesting kind of concept, let's just accept the tests are unreliable and not have more tests to tackle that reliability because of the overwhelming nature of more tests. Um, I have got a question, but does anyone want to respond to that point of let's accept the unreliability and that's the best we can get to? Well, what's the alternative? That's, I guess, the question, right? Like, you, you need data, like, right? To, you're going to make a, like, some data is better than none. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. But everybody understands that in polling, you know, the margin of error means it's too close to call. Well, we can actually get people, I think, to understand the same idea here that, you know, the the, let's say the past. The passing score is 70. Your child got 65 plus or minus 10. Did they pass? Don't know. Probably not, but maybe. Why don't you know? Because no test is reliable. Why can't you make the more tests more reliable? We could. We can make them longer, and your child will spend all their time being tested, and we have better things to do with the time. So I think that's the challenge. We have to educate pa parents and other stakeholders that our technology of assessment will never be reliable enough for, to support the kinds of conclusions that people want to draw. And my hope is people will then say, let's not make high stakes decisions about things like third grade retention without having other sources of evidence. Let's embrace the unreliability and say, okay, what other evidence do we have that will help us make a better decision? 100%. Um, do you want to respond to that? I was gonna say, I think too, it's that notion of 
thinking of this da these data as an assessment as formative themselves yeah. too and not just summative. And I think even when we were describing that framework of thinking about how we would work, how we would like to work with our customers on setting goals for engagement, progress, achievement, and growth, that that's a formative infrastructure. And you have to take that data and those assessments and couple it with what a teacher knows, what a, what a district knows, what a human being knows. And so I think the idea also is not treating even that data, those data and assessment that are built in as only summative and carved in stone, but the entire approach of what you do with that data is from a formative approach about how you adjust what you're doing and how serving that individual student or at a district level making those decisions. I would go even further. Let's use the words formative and summative to describe not the assessments, nor even the data, but the uses that we make of the information. We draw summative conclusions and we draw formative conclusions, and we can do that on the same data. That's right. So thank you for, for the contribution on this, and, and we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. I just want to um, realize we're running out of time a little bit, and I'd love to invite um, Michael to step in a little bit on this. Um, more broadly, we're on the first day of this, of this, uh, this workshop, this summit, this, uh, this conference. So I think we've got a great opportunity to talk a little bit about AI and chat GPT. So I'd love to invite you to kind of set the tone for the next two days, and maybe you know, what is your kind of vision or view on where AI or ChatGPT could get us in terms of assessment? Um, and I invite others to follow on afterwards because this will hopefully set the tone for, you know, the conversation we have over the next two, three days. Yeah, look, it's a, it's a really interesting question. We're at a time, you know, a revolutionary time, I suppose, this commoditized uh, AI. Um, and there's, there's absolutely um, a lot of people saying, look, we need to be really, really careful about how we use this technology uh, in and out of the classroom, and I agree with that. Um, however, the application it, it is almost unlimited in what you could do with it. Um, for us, what we're really trying to think about, how can we improve the efficiency of teachers in a classroom? How can we help them do their jobs better? We're not looking to replace them. It's how can we, again, make it so much easier, um, whether that's you know, content generation for a formative test. As you said, we're always time poor. No one's got time. Well, what if we could do things um, in half the time, in a third of the time, in a quarter of the time? Um, what if we could use it, uh, as I was saying before, about feedback, this formative journey? I mean, summative, sure, at the end, but it should be about you know, improving learning outcomes. That's really what we're trying to do. And can we use the technology to help students learn? Not know that they handed in a better result, but that they actually learn better because the systems, the technology is helping them say, well, this isn't quite right. Have you thought about trying it this way? Okay, let me try. Okay, now I can see you're on the mark. You know, keep going. So um, certainly helping teachers, you know, AI, I think, it, you know, is really, really exciting. Um, we're, we're heads down, bums up on this, on really trying to uh, work with our customers on what might, what might, uh, give teachers more time back in the classroom and improve uh, learning outcomes. That's what it's all about. Yeah, I thought we were, all speakers are contractually obligated to utter chat GPT, I think this week. I think that's like, a, um, I mean, it, it, I, we agree to, I mean, I think in our courseware business, side of the business, academic integrity is always something we've struggled with, right? And technology didn't invent issues with academic integrity and, and chat GPT is not gonna, further it anymore. So I think the idea of how do we actually turn it and think about something that's positive, I think there are ways for when we've, when we've begun to think about the use of that technology is really taking content and matching it with differentiation. What are ways that we could harness that to, to think about ways that we're really supporting the teacher in similar ways that you're talking about? And also not being overly afraid, I think, of issues we were already wrestling with with just technology of what, what students may have access to and how we just continue to, to address that. And no one else wish to opine? I mean, I just say I, I do hope it does help free up time for teachers because right now they spend not nearly sufficient amount of time actually teaching and doing other stuff. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that generative AI and other advanced technologies can, can solve uh, that problem first and foremost. Fantastic. So we're coming up close on time. So um, one question, Paul, that I'd love to, to ask you, that I think we discussed before, is stepping away from, from K-12, we're clear the focus has been today, stepping away maybe from the US, which maybe we are sometimes slightly too focused on. Um, what can we learn about or from assessment or from professional development 
or from learning progress across the spectrum from uh, zero to, to, to gray and bring into, into K-12 in the US? I mean, I think the focus on, on skills uh, while sort of always, or not always, but recently has been uh, very buzzy in, in workforce, I think you're starting to be able, you're starting to see that sort of move down into K-12, higher up the grade stack. I think that it, um, yeah, I think skills are sort of the new currency, and I think we're going to see that more and more as um, the future of higher ed evolves, um, sort of longer pathways, apprenticeship programs, there's sort of all of that stuff will ultimately, I think, move, move further down and in the grade stack. And, and you see that, you know, we, we touched on some international topics, but like Singapore, I think, is a good example of a country that they have this skills future program that, that you're, you're starting to see really good results out of. Fantastic. Okay. Um, we have a, a short amount of time left, and I'd like to invite each of the, the panelists to kind of share some, some closing thoughts. I asked them before to kind of maybe share one hero story, like a positive story of, of something they're seeing in the education that they would like to share to end on an optimistic note about the power of assessment. I'm gonna, I'm gonna broaden the question a little bit and talk about, you know, you each take you know, 20 to 30 seconds to share kind of one anecdote or one story of where you've seen great assessment deployed and used either at the, you know, at the macro level or more micro classroom level that gives, makes you optimistic about the power of assessment and where we can get to. Um, who, who would like to go first? Yeah, I'll take that. So. Um, I'm going to tell you to look on a news uh, media story that has to do with Florida. And if you Google or look up uh, um, Coral Gables FAST, F-A-S-T, uh, test, and you're going to find a recent article about how the Florida, Florida, their statewide test, turned sort of on, a, on its heels this past year. Instead of just an end-of-year summative test, they now have tests three times a year. And they're using those tests um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the fall, in the winter, and then again in the spring. This article, it's, it's actually it's a news piece. Um, and uh, it's very interesting about how the principals, how the teachers, and how the kids are reacting uh, to these now completely online tests, tests that are also using um, AI and getting results back immediately, and how teachers are using those in the classroom. It's a very impressive uh, uh, read. Who would like to share next? Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I can just build on that because I live in Florida um, and I have a first grader. And that fast test. Um, so, so we spent the last couple of years educating our, our young daughter abroad and in a different school system in Spain that I actually didn't know much about. And that fast test was fantastic to set a baseline. And then watching progress as she learns to read and and write was fascinating. And I thought the fast test actually it was a good starting point. I think one of the things um, for me is, is, is more general across many of our customers, but the last couple of years, it's been really exciting to see the demand for accessibility, really talking about inclusive, uh, inclusiveness, but it comes across as are you accessible, which is a very hard question to answer. Um, but more and more of our customers uh, are getting their own audits, and uh, often we find people will come to us because of where we're at with accessibility, and they'll find that there are more problems on their own platform by tenfold than there are with us. So we're really passionate about inclusivity, um, you know, democratizing educational technology for everybody. So seeing the positive impact it's having for our customers, for me, is a, is a great hero story. Dylan or Elizabeth? It's impossible for me to think of just one success story, but I think maybe the flip is just really specific. I mean, when you talk about having hope, I mean, we see every day, we do see customers that are telling us about that improvement that's being made. We have success stories where those, they're seeing students really be able to achieve that gap and talk about the assessment that helps drive that. So I think it's just the reality of when you work with customers, there is so much that we're struggling with, but there's so much that is positive too that I think when we think about the, the gains that we've made. It's just making it personal, I think. In a previous life, I was an assistant provost of a university that had the largest medical school in Europe. And our students were entirely drawn from private schools. We, it, the school was located in the most, one of the most diverse parts of London, and we were recruiting zero students from our local area. Those students weren't getting the grades they needed to get into medical school. So we actually devised a new method of assessing about 
but focused on how quickly these students could integrate new scientific ideas into their existing thinking. We benchmarked it on existing medical students, so nobody could accuse us of dumbing down. And we actually recruited 50 students from the local area who, by the end of the third year of the medical degree program, were indistinguishable from those who'd come in with the traditional qualifications. The positive story here is, let's, let's find different ways of identifying talent. Let's not rely on things like SAT and SAT, or even high school grade point average. Are you sure those are the only ways of identifying talent? Let's encourage people to say, let's find other ways of letting this talent become unleashed. I think that is the very positive story we can end on. Thank you. And on that note, I uh, thank you, panelists, for your time, and thank you, the audience, for coming in.